All right, welcome everyone to another session of the Library of Things collab. Today, we're gonna to be talking about membership, um, digging into the ways that various co uh, existing libraries of things are um, charging and not charging for memberships, uh, what benefits and privileges are, are offered and issues around access and accessibility. Um, access to, to libraries of things and spaces, but also accessibility to be able to um, get to and utilize the items that the libraries of things have. We're gonna, uh, we've got a great uh, set of presenters today, um, including Tim Willison from the Toronto Tool Library and Toronto Tool Library Makerspace, Keenan Phillips uh, from the Asheville Tool Library and Jason Nauman from Green Lentz and the new Rockwood Common in Portland. And with that, we're gonna get started right away and I'm gonna pass it off to Tim. Oh, hello. And uh, uh, actually, let me let me uh, quickly, I'm gonna go ahead and share, share my screen, I forgot to do that. <laughs> All righty. Hey, everybody. Hi there. Okay, so we should have some uh, slides coming up. And um, are you able to yeah. see that? Are you able to see those slides? I am. Is it just the slide deck or is it something else? Just the slide deck. Excellent. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess I'm kicking it off here. So uh, as the slide mentioned, uh, I'm the executive director currently at the Toronto Tool Library, as well as the TTL Makerspace. And uh, I got involved around 2018. Uh, so some of what I'll relate is coming from uh, more from documents. Um, and um, so kicking it off in terms of membership, uh, yeah, we have a, a tiered membership system currently. Uh, it wasn't always like that. Uh, up until 2017, it was a, a single tier uh, with a really simple pricing structure. Uh, currently, we have three tiers. So we have the basic, uh, which is 55 Canadian dollars uh, per year. And that gives people um, three-day borrowing terms. Uh, with some borrowing fees that could be anywhere from $2 to $10. They're mostly on items that have a battery or have a really high maintenance involved with them. Uh, we have the twice fund, which is 85 for the year. That gives you the seven days borrowing and uh, has the exact same fee uh, borrowing fee structure as the basic. And then we have the high five, uh, which is 110 for the year actually gives 14 days of borrowing and has no fees associated with it, except for late fees, of course, uh, those uh, apply across the board. <laughs> and then um, in terms of other benefits that apply to, to all the membership tiers, um, there's no item limits. Uh, we have a few different monthly workshops, like a tool basics and sewing workshop and so forth that are, uh, educational in nature and very hands-on. Uh, we have a fair amount of project mentoring. Uh, people will come in and describe what their project is, like they're trying to, you know, fix their kitchen or something like that. And um, we'll give them lots of advice on how they could approach it, what tools they would use. And we have a fairly good library of educational materials that we've made uh, that everybody gets access to. Um, now, all of this said, I don't think our structure is that good. <laughs> uh, it needs work. And uh, I can talk a little bit in the next um, slide about changes that occurred over time. Uh, as I've mentioned 2017. So the Toronto Tool Library in, the, in late 2017 um, uh, engaged in a fairly large campaign um, to save the Toronto Tool Library. Uh, had run into a number of different financial difficulties and problems, and um, so needed basically to, to raise funds. Now, I think that the change to the tiered system was basically in response to that financial need 
and trying to figure out uh, some way that would work better than the simple system. Now, the campaign was successful, um, but uh, before too long, the similar problem started to occur again. Uh, I got involved in late 2018 and became the executive director early 2019. And um, so started, started working on the problem. Um, so the change to the tiered system, um, I, I think there were a few problems uh, generated by that. Uh, the first was that it was somewhat confusing for people. It was very simple messaging prior to that and explaining the different tiers and the conditions of the different tiers um, is a little bit harder to manage for, for staff and a little bit harder to digest for people who are coming to the tool library. Um, but the big problem was that it vastly increased the costs in terms of storage, um, especially the, the top tier with the high five and the 14 day borrowing. Um, if you think about it, you know, four to five basic members could use a tool during the same time uh, that a high five member will have it. And um, so this then means you need to stock a lot more inventory, which means you need a lot more space. You have a lot more uh, repair parts and brands and trim levels and so forth that you have to support. Um, and personally, I, I think the probably the real unexpected problem is that it sort of took us in a different direction from the, the mission. Because um, if you think about it, uh, with no, no fees at the highest tier, it sort of ends up that people who have more money and can afford to the, the more expensive tier are sort of being subsidized by people who have less money and, uh, you know, and pay those borrowing fees. And um, so this, you know, this, certainly this is not an intentional effect, but it, it became apparent afterwards. Uh, and then we also have noted many times that people who have those very long borrowing terms are much more likely to procrastinate and uh, bring the tool back having not actually used it. Because, <laughs> you, you know, uh, human nature, you, you, you know, I've taught in college, people, always, if they have a long time to write a paper, they wait until the, you know, a <laughs> couple of days before. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing with tools. And um, so, yeah, those were kind of uh, big lessons learned. And um, so, yeah, in terms of uh, advice we could give, if we want to advance to the last slide there. Um, A uh, little bit back, there should be one slide for advice. Here we go. Uh, keeping good data is probably the number one thing. Uh, reviewing inventory and being aware of the hard costs associated with the different inventory, uh, you know, that can include removing items that um, are very rarely borrowed or, or perhaps never borrowed. Uh, here in Toronto, it's uh, famously the most expensive city in Canada. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, we're in the most dense urban area of the most expensive city. So space is at a premium. Um, planning for the effects of inflation. So I think the reason we ended up with a tier system was because we didn't have um, logical, like small increases uh, rated against inflation. And so costs kept going up until, uh, you know, it kind of caught the whole organization by the surprise, we're actually in some trouble. Um, putting uh, some of what you make back into tangible improvements and being good at communicating those to the members so that they know those things are available is really important. Uh, you probably want to have a plan for uh, some level of staffing after the initial years of operation and um, avoiding like complicated, difficult to understand membership systems and then planning for and communicating about the evolution of the organization over time. Uh, probably what you are doing in year one and year two 
uh, may become less effective in year four, five and beyond. And so planning so that no one gets left behind or wonders what's going on as changes happen is, uh, is pretty important. And I think I've well used up my 10 minutes of fame. <laughs> Hopefully that uh, information is useful to everyone. Yeah, well, I'm wondering, actually, uh, one, if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat. We're going to pause for questions after every uh, presenter just to talk about each case study for a few minutes. Um, you know, you talked about the, you know, that you moved to the tiered system. Can you go in a little bit more detail? It's like, how are you, are you, pl how are you planning on changing moving forward? And yeah. uh, have you thought about what that structure, you know, is it a balance? Like, what is, what are you, what are you going to do in Toronto? So we're definitely going to move away from the tiered system. Um, we started talking about that more than two years ago, just to get people used to the idea. Uh, the problem is that once you give something to people, it is very difficult to remove it. <laughs> they, they get used to it. And um, so what we've been doing is uh, building up our other organization uh, in the maker space until it would reach a point that, um, you know, in order to roll back some of the changes, it would not be a, you know, an ending event for the tool library if we had a, a, a sudden loss of membership or dip in membership. Now that may be overly cautious. I think the satisfaction levels are very high among the members. And uh, in the downtown area, as I say, it's not, it's not easy running something like this. So um, it's it's a well loved feature, but just to be um, just to be on the safe side, we've been building up our our makerspace so that uh, we would be able to absorb any temporary losses that we might have as we transition away from tiers, and especially as we remove that fourteen day borrowing that's been the biggest problem. Got it. And there was a uh, a question, a couple of kind of maybe related questions. One, um, Kate asks, uh, what percentage of your income is do the membership dues cover? And then a follow-up from Francesca is, what percentage of members are at that top tier? Mm. So it's about, uh, for the last question, uh, it's about 55% of members are at the top tier. Um, memberships make up the bulk of the revenue, I would say, uh, like around 80% of revenue comes from that. Um, but this, again, is most likely due to the fact that we have 55% of our members that don't pay any borrowing fees. And uh, mm -hmm. that, that really needs to be corrected so that it's more evenly distributed across all of the membership, I think. Got it. And uh, Claire kind of asks, so these changes from the tiered system um, you know, in relation to it, did you predict that um, you would have to have more space or acquire more tools to cover the deficit? Um, or is that something that was foreseen? Not foreseen. Uh, <laughs> it was rather unexpected, the effect that that would have. And I, I honestly, I would say, didn't uh, fully reveal itself until the pandemic. Uh, during mm -hmm. the pandemic, we had to do a lot of reorganization. And uh, we started, uh, you know, really calculating up like, well, what is the, the cost of the square footage that we're using compared to its utilization? I guess you would term it um, opportunity costs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we we reorganized all of that during the pandemic um, with the goal that, you know, when we come out of pandemic conditions, we're going to have a real, um, we'll have a short runway to, to get our momentum back again. And uh, mm -hmm. so we had a good, I guess the, the, the positive side of it was we had time to think and organize and, and really plan our strategy there. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, look at the, the overall effect of the tiered system. Got it. And I've got a, uh, another kind of, maybe it's a side question, but it's my memory that Toronto tool library had, there was two or three locations at one point in time. Is that right? 
Yeah, there were three locations. Yeah. Uh, so there was um, uh, one um, in Parkdale, uh, one on St. Clair, and uh, then we're where I am right now is um, at the Spadina location. So in the first four months of the, after four months of closures in the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. we had to close the St. Clair location. Um, then the Parkdale location, uh, that uh, our space there actually got um, uh, closed because of a mold problem. And um, so they had to do uh, quite a bit of renovation work in there. So we basically took uh, the Spadina location and rolled a lot of our resources into there, which I think was ended up being a very good survival strategy during the pandemic. Um, most of our locations were open less than 20 hours a week, whereas here we're open every day. Um, and uh, the hours are a lot more convenient to folks now we are benefiting from also being in the same location as the maker space. So we have a lot of benefits of being able to kind of share resources between them. And um, uh, some of the staffing is also shared between the two organizations. Uh, so those mm -hmm. things kind of helped us to get through the tough time and then um, have kind of helped us to, to thrive and succeed uh, following that. We have, we, we are much more stabilized now than we were in previous years. And we don't really have a reliance on things like public funding and so forth. Got it. Um, and a couple more questions coming in. I just wanted to just quick follow up related to members. Um, did members from those little locations transition to this singular location or was there some shedding of members at that time? Uh, the majority of them moved to the single location. Uh, the okay. locations were not spread out that far. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about, you know, 15, 20 minutes um, between them. And so, um, yeah, so so we, we have uh, about 80% of the membership that we had with three locations, we currently have with the single location. Location, okay. And are, are there... Um... Can you just touch back on real quick about the relationship between the makerspace and the tool library? Is there a joint uh, membership for those or any other types of, of perks related to being a member of one or the other? No, they are completely separate. Um, the Canadian okay. government requires us to keep them quite separate because they have different organizational incorporations. The uh, tool library is a nonprofit. The makerspace is a registered charity. So they are required to, to be quite separate. Now, um, I will say a lot of people do end up getting memberships with both <laughs> because it's, uh, they are very symbiotic uh, relationship there. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people working in the maker space will get a tool library membership to take some things home to finish up projects. And a lot of people coming into the tool library are quite surprised and ask, yo, hey, what's going on over there? Um, mm -hmm. It looks like there's a full shop over there. And uh, so the, the tool library provides a nice introduction to people who might yep. be interested to come into the maker space. Got it. And um, we do need to wrap up and transition over. But right before we do, there's a couple of questions that I think are a little bit related. Um, one is uh, when you transition from the single fee to the tiered structure, uh, how engaged were your existing members in identifying the kind of the price points and the benefits? And um, and then two, can you go in a little bit more detail how, about how you're planning to adjust the multi-tier system and if there's a plan to engage members in that process and what you think that'll look like? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, people are fairly conscious of like, like they definitely think about it when they're um, selecting their tier. If I'm understanding the, the question correctly, um, mm -hmm. like people are fairly price conscious. Um, I think uh, what one thing that is nice for people is that if they 
um, get a, a, say the basic tier and they find that they mm -hmm. need more than three days of borrowing, we'll deduct what they've already paid from upgrading to one of the other tiers. Mm -hmm. So that gives people a fairly non-threatening way to get started. Um, but I do think they, they choose rather, rather carefully when they're selecting their membership. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of transitioning away from the tier system, uh, I think it's really all coming down to communication. As I say, we, we have started communicating this stuff out through uh, our website and just talking to the members. And, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people, uh, I, I think a lot of people buy the higher tier directly because they want to support more um, and don't really have that that inside view that um, it actually creates more problems for the tool library than does the the more basic tiers. And uh, so I think really it's a it's an education effort. Uh, we've got a pretty active mm -hmm. mailing list. Uh, we have a very active Discord community. Um, and I think that uh, those things are going to be pretty important. We also have events like member appreciation events where we invite everybody in and, you know, share some food and, mm -hmm. and chat with people. And I think those are going to provide a really good opportunity. So hopefully mm -hmm. we've done our work well enough. It won't be a big surprise. Yeah. And how many members total do you have? There's uh, 900 for the tool library uh, mm -hmm. who are the active active members from a pool of about 5,000 who sort of come and go. And then mm -hmm. um, for the makerspace, there's 160 active monthly members from a pool of about 800 that will come and go as they have projects. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, please stick around. And uh, if you have a chance, we'll maybe have some more questions at the end if there's still room for that. Sure. And and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Keenan with the Asheville Tool Library. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Keenan Phillips. I am on the board of directors for the Asheville Tool Library, have been for a little over three years now. Uh, I've been the chairman of the board for the last two years. And um, there's been a lot of great folks before us uh, and before me including Tom, who was one of the founders of the Asheville Tool Library. So it's really fun to be circling back uh, to that. Uh, you want to go to the next slide, Tom? There you go. So um, just getting you some pictures, because I know the words and the slides can be a little bit boring. That's our website homepage and um, showing over on the right. Um, I think actually, Tom, I might have change the order you may be stuck in the old order do you want to try refreshing yeah that that's a little sorry making some some last minute edits thanks yep thanks for for bearing with us also let me get this yeah. uh my internet's just going a little choppy right now all right i think i got cool. the new order okay let's all go right. yeah Slideshow. so um that's um that's myself and um uh, co-board member stephanie kane who's house I'm actually at because I'm a contractor working on it. Um, you can see our hours there. That was during our move into our most recent space. So there's a lot more stuff uh, in there, but just had a picture to throw in. Um, so here's a few quick stats. We use the MyTurn software and have been for pretty much the entirety of our eight years. Uh, we've completed around 70,000 loans. We currently have around 900 members and 2,800 items. Uh, you can see over to the left that there's about 59 things that are currently overdue. So 
that's not too bad out of all those items. Um, so all of our members, we don't do any tiers or anything. Everybody gets access to those 2,800 or so items. Uh, things are available for rent for up to seven days at a time. We don't have an explicit maximum number of tools. Um, the maximum number of tools as well as renewals on tools are somewhat left to the lead librarian's discretion. They're going to check things like availability of those tools. If it's chop saws, like something that we have a dozen or so of, and we have 10 of them there and somebody wants to renew it, we'll let them do that. Um, we've had a few issues with people taking out a lot of tools and then having a hard time uh, keeping track of them and getting them all back. So it just kind of depends on if we see uh, a big reservation of like 30, 40, 50 tools, we might kind of ask ask around and, and check in with each other, maybe look back at that member's history to see if we're concerned about that number of tools. Um, we have some small usage fees on some items that have like really high consumable costs. So uh, concrete saw is one example of that. They require a diamond uh, blade that can on a bigger saw cost somewhere around a hundred dollars. So at most we're charging about $10 per item. We've also got a big uh, four inch chipper and uh, a gas MIG welder is another example that comes, you can get the gas tank with it. So that's $10 per borrowing as well, because you're going to consume some of that gas. And we ask folks if they empty it in their turn to take it by the place to get it refilled and bring it back filled up. And we'll give them the money back for the whole refill charge if they didn't use the whole thing. Um, late fees are for most things, a dollar per tool per day. Um, we keep batteries, chargers, and the actual like cordless tool that they may go with as separate items in our inventory. It's just easier to keep track of things. Sometimes somebody wants two or three batteries. Um, each of those things though, the battery, the charger, and the tool are, are considered as uh, individual items. So each of those is gonna have that dollar per tool per day late fee late fee and those late fees do accrue even on our closed days we're open monday wednesday saturday and sunday you can see the specific hours there um so that's yeah that's how we've been doing it um, most people do not seem to be bothered by that that seems like a pretty small amount but it actually makes up i want to say somewhere around 20 percent of our annual income um so it's kind of helpful. Uh, as far as perks, members uh, really don't have any perks other than everything that's up there. The, the perks we do for active volunteers because we only have one uh, paid employee and they are paid for about 20 to 25 hours a week. So otherwise we are very heavily rely on volunteers. Um, so to be qualified as an active volunteer, that is working more than 15 hours per quarter. And at the end of each quarter, when our uh, pool library manager checks through who's, you know, everybody's hours, they pick out a small gift for everybody. Sometimes it's tool library swag. Um, sometimes it's gift cards to different places around town. Um, it varies. They also get invited to quarterly volunteer socials and potluck events. And then probably the best thing is they get the door code and they are allowed to come in 24 seven, get something. They are trained to properly check things in and out and um, considered to be responsible enough to, you know, make sure they're not bringing back broken things and just throwing them in inventory and pretending like nothing happened. But for us, that's, I would say, most worth prioritizing because we really, really need volunteers. Um, so yeah, this is our website homepage. Um, and over on the right, so in addition, all our members are kind of grouped in the, um, you, you go to one page and you can do the membership or you can also apply for a scholarship. And Bobby pointed out to me earlier, he thought it was really cool that 
they're just kind of on the same page. The scholarship isn't super isolated from a uh, paid membership and that maybe that just is a small thing that makes it easier for people that are, you know, needing that scholarship to be able to go down that path. So our sliding scale paid memberships, currently we have a sliding scale of 50 to $250 a year. If somebody goes online to sign up for one on their own, the preset that we have is right in the middle of that range at $150. Um, we raised that about a couple years ago. The, our sliding scale was 50 to 150, and we had a $100 preset. And when we looked at the data, it seemed like a lot of people were just going right in the middle, right at that $100. And we thought, you know, maybe they're doing that because they need it to cost $100, but maybe they're doing that just because it is one less click for people to do. And maybe they're just going to like, whatever that preset is, like it's really, really easy to change that number um, if you if you want to or need to. So we were like, well, let's, let's play with this. Let's not raise the lower end, but let's raise the upper end and adjust that middle range. And that actually worked out really well for us. A lot of people are still going right in the middle at $150. And so that brought up our income a little bit without feeling like we were kind of excluding um, anybody needing that lower cost. Uh, and then the scholarships on that page of four, if you just click on that lower link, it takes you to a simple Google form, um, which I think I've got some screenshots of on the next page. Um, so yeah, it's this. these are screenshots from my cell phone. The top gives a quick description. Um, and then there are four questions to answer. Tell us your full name, your email, whether or not this is your first time uh, having a membership at the tool library, and then what you're planning to do with the tools. So that then gets sent to a Google spreadsheet. Um, one of the board members uh, reviews these, which has been me for the past couple of years. And people put a variety of things in for those answers. I just read it and kind of, um, we're pretty much not turning anybody away every now and then somebody accidentally went to this form who like wants information or wants to volunteer. So for the most part, that's what I'm checking for. Like, Oh, you should email the volunteer coordinator. And th this isn't, this isn't the way to do that. Um, there was one other thing on this slide before, which was that when we were, first opening up uh, or hadn't hadn't opened yet and we're fundraising, uh, we offered lifetime memberships for $500. And as far as I know, that worked really well. Every now and then I've seen somebody who is uh, one of those lifetime members. But um, I, I think that's a that was a really good tool. I wasn't I wasn't around then that this is kind of from hearsay, but I am working towards opening another tool library nearby. And planning to do the same thing, I think it's a great way to just get an idea of, is this something people in your area really want and are really excited about supporting um, early on and hoping to have in the area for a while. Hmm. Oh, and there was, you had one more question uh, that you wanted us to address, which was, sorry, do you remember it, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I, there, I had a couple of questions, actually. Oh, so, well, there was, have you had yep, issues ahead. with members? Have you had issues yep. with members and how have you resolved them? Um, I would say that the biggest thing is is um, late or even not. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. We were playing mute tag. Um, no, sorry. Uh, biggest problem, I'd say, is late or, or not at all returned tools. Um, we... About a year ago, we're really working on beefing up our membership agreement um, and are now requiring a, a valid credit card to be kept on file. And people are authorizing us basically to, if they disappear, they aren't talking to us. We're trying to communicate, hey, something's late. Can we, can we help? What can we do? And they're not paying it and they're not responding. That we do have the authority to just 
charge that card. Um, we do realize that sometimes people end up in situations where they just they aren't able to communicate with us at least for some amount of time. So our policy delays charging that card for several weeks and we have a maximum of the replacement cost of the tool. Um, luckily, one of our current board members was in library and inventory management technology for the Army for many, many years and has gone through our entire inventory and assessed everything with a replacement value that is pretty accurate. So we have that. Um, that's something you can put into the My Turn software with every item and have those late fees stop accruing when it actually meets uh, that amount of the replacement cost. So that's our maximum late fee for every tool is just, hey, we got to replace it now. You can keep it or whatever. Great. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, there is kind of a follow-up. Uh, I saw Stephanie just answering in the chat chat also, but yeah. so we can make sure we capture this on video. Um, you know, has there been any pushback from members? I know one of the reasons why we didn't initially ask for a credit card and file and why a number of libraries don't was uh, for accessibility. Uh, to be able to make sure that that people could become members if they were unbanked, if they didn't have access to credit, um, if they had other financial you know issues, we didn't want that to be a barrier. And it's a it is definitely something that has to be weighed, right? Because then you know, how else do you track somebody down? You know, what is what does that relationship look like? Uh, I've heard of some libraries, you know, uh, making so somebody can't check out large items, you know, the first couple of times mm -hmm. they've got to check out a hammer or something really basic to begin with to make sure they're bringing it back. Totally. Um, so as kind of a two part question, um, how have you, how have you, you know, put in any type of safeguards up to this point? And, uh, now that you are requiring a credit card, has there been any pushback or have you heard from any members that that was going to be a barrier? Yeah. So, I mean, that, this was a, I think we talked about it for se at, at several board meetings because a lot of us were concerned that that would be a barrier to entry. So the revision before this of our membership agreement, I think we had about 10 different ways somebody could verify their identity. I was like, you know, bringing in a, a bill from a local company and, and this and that. And it was, it was a lot to pass on to the one staff person and, and beyond that, all of the volunteers who, you know, we're trying to keep things as simple as we can. It's hard enough just checking tools in and out properly. Um, so it it was kind of, um, a, it took us a while to get to just like, let's just do the credit card thing. And and knowing that it was a, it was a trial, like if we had gotten a lot of pushback, I think we would definitely change. Um, if, if somebody came in and said, hey, I don't have a credit card, we would certainly work with them and, and find a way to work around it. But yeah, Stephanie said there's been like almost no pushback. Excellent. And um, so kind of another related question to kind of registration, uh, wondering, do you require members to register online before coming in? And the question is kind of coming because there was, uh, you know, potentially concerns about member comfort, you know, inputting their payment info in a public device at the library mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah. So is that something that you've worked on or addressed in some way? Um, so people can sign up online or directly at the library. A lot of times we have people signing up, like if we have all of our events are just open to the public. You don't have to be a member. Um, sometimes people are signing up there. And the most of the librarians are going to say something like they're going to type in all that person's basic info for them. I mean, usually if I'm there, I'll, they say, oh, I want to sign up for a membership. I say, cool, if you want, we can do it right here. You can I can type everything in for you. And also you can just go to our website and you can stand there, you know, on in the corner or sit on. We've got a couple couches now. Uh, you can sit over there and do it. And in 10 minutes, you know, let me know what you want to check out. Um, but if I am manually entering something for somebody or, or another librarian is they're usually going to say, Hey, it's 50 to 250 suggested donation per year. Um, a lot of people go right in the middle at 150, like no judgment. What's, what's good for you? What works for you? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the, the way we, 
our our culture at the tool library and and the way that we all know it just amazingly keeps working and there's not a lot of big pressure to like oh get that 250 bucks if you can that that passes on to that member and they really feel at ease just you know saying whatever works for them great and i just want to ask uh we've got to wrap up and yeah. Uh, move on to our next speakers. But there was a question here. Well, one, uh, would you be willing to share the valuation sheet that you've created with other libraries? It seems like there's some ex other existing libraries that are represented on the collab today that would be interested in potentially seeing that. And so they wouldn't have to recreate the wheel. Um, yeah, I, th I think we could. Can you can you follow up with me about that, Tom, yep, after yep, this? Yep. To, okay, yeah. Yep, definitely. So we can follow up about that. And then another question was around commercial use of items. Um, you know, do you allow people to use and borrow tools for commercial use, um, you know, for their business? And or have you considered creating a membership level for, uh, you know, professionals? Um. That's something we're a little bit loose on still. I mean, if somebody says, hey, I've got a big construction company and I'm going to like borrow this once a month or we'll would probably be like, you should like consider, you know, maybe borrow it once to see if it's a tool mm -hmm. that's really helpful and valuable. But, you know, if you're a business, like you should probably find a way to afford it with your business. Um, but I mean, for the most part, it, it's stuff we're still having conversation about, but we want these tools to get used. We we dislike the culture of buying something, using it once, and then it going to the landfill. So like our shelves being kind of towards the side of empty is a good thing. The mm -hmm. tools are getting used. Yeah. So um, and then fi final question. If, yeah, final question before we pass on. I'll actually just say you know one of the things that I actually do really appreciate about tool library specifically is that they can be um, used for professional development, right? It, they can mm -hmm. lower the barrier of entry to get into a trade. And Absolutely. so uh, people don't have to take out as much debt um, before starting a business doing uh, yard work or doing carpentry or doing plumbing or any of these things. And they can uh, utilize a tool library to access those materials, to build up a business, to then be able to get the capital necessary to be able to invest in their own materials rather than going into debt, oftentimes at very high interest levels. And so there can be a major uh, benefit to uh, attracting people that are new to the trades um, that may not otherwise have financial access. And that was one of the, the ethics that we brought into the development of the Asheville Tool Library initially as one of our kind of three um, kind of core tenants, one supporting that kind of professional development and, and business work, two around the environmental impact and uh, three around just the access to goods in general and, and reducing the financial barrier to uh, all kinds of materials. Um, all right, so I'm gonna move on because we're out of time and I see yeah. Ada, you had a final uh, question which we might be able to get later, but I wanna make sure that we give enough time for Jason as well. So thank you so much, Keenan. Hey everyone. Um... Sorry, I was just throwing in some responses in the chat. Um, so Portland Tool Libraries, um, we can go at, right into the first slide, Tom. Um, we have a pretty unique um, ecosystem. Uh, so there's seven independent tool libraries currently in the city. Um, there was, um, just to run through super quickly, uh, because the boundary system really has, I think, evolved in Portland based on this. Uh, I have to give you a little bit of a preview on that. So North Portland uh, was the first one that started in 2004, and uh, they kind of set their boundaries. Big part, it's there's a lot of area in North Portland, um, and it's some of it is, is pretty dispersed. Um, and there's a couple of major highways that kind of divide the city on the vertical lines, which you probably could predict just by looking at this map. Uh, and so I think some of it was a little bit arbitrary in establishing those boundaries um, based on those things and just based on what people's perspective was on that. Um, but because of those things, uh, the rest of the libraries that have come online, um, Northeast right there in the blue is 2008, uh, 2010 below that is Southeast. So those were the three main libraries uh, for quite a while. Greenlands, who um, I've been working with 
uh, came online in 2013. Um, and then the other three libraries you see there, Southwest, East Portland, and uh, the Rockwood Library uh, have really been able to fill in those gaps just in the last year or so. Um, so it is, it is a growing uh, process for sure, but because of kind of the standards that were set with the initial um, library setups, we've been kind of following suit. Um, and so it's caused us to have uh, kind of a unique system from you know, places that cover a much, much wider set of area within each library. Um, we also have a pretty robust system with our different library of things, uh, Clackamas County, which is to the south portion of Portland, Washington County to the west portion of Portland, also have a really robust library of things. Um, recently found out when I was researching this that they have 837 Nintendo Switch games uh, in Washington. And uh, just also did a little bit of research for my own purposes that you can actually be a member of any of those library systems because they are affiliated. So that's on my to-do list. Um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, what our library system looks like. Membership is really defined by uh, those boundaries. So you can see quite a bit about uh, how usage adjusts. I think one of the reasons uh, that Southwest was so late to kind of come online is because that is a, a, a very much the urban hub. Uh, there's uh, more people of means and there's more apartment housing and commercial space there. Um, so it just was not a priority for residents as much over there to get a tool library set up. And I think that's kind of why it took so long to really not only build the enthusiasm for the project, uh, but to get uh, find a space for it has been the biggest issue. Portland has seen a, a lot of change recently. Uh, and so it's definitely affected some of us later uh, establishers. Um, North Portland, I don't have a lot of information on right now. They're having a hard time with volunteers post COVID uh, or at the current state of where COVID is at, I should say. I don't know if post-COVID exists as a state, um, but the rest of us, because we use the same tool library and software and we're in decent communication together, I could get some more information. So uh, Northeast Portland has a very sizable um, number of total members that they've served since being established in 2008. Um, but you know, 2000 active members is really quite a few people that they're able to support. Uh, they are open uh, three days a week, two weekdays, and a weekend. Um, Southeast Portland is open one weekday and one weekend day. Um, and at Lentz, we do uh, one Saturday and then a Wednesday night. So it's kind of that Saturday morning um, mixed bag of which weekday, but a couple of hours on the weekday is, is about as much as we're open. Um, and we, we don't... Uh, charge membership, none of us do. And I think, again, that's kind of the standards were set early on, 2004, um, and everybody just kind of moved into that space. Uh, it's worked pretty well, as my understanding for, for everybody. Um, I'll get in a little bit into why it has been problematic somewhat for Lentz, um, but I think the biggest benefits um, for me we like the vibe. Um, everybody who we talk to about it, when we talk to different organizations and community members and volunteers, uh, other people who've been on boards, you know, for over 20 years, um, we just really appreciate and think that it's very cool that we're able to have it uh, accessible to everyone. Um, it's been great over the last year or so of this collab process to learn about how accessible all of the libraries are. Uh, with scholarship programs and different ways of, of sharing that access. Uh, it's definitely changed our thinking at Lentz and some of the other areas. It would be nice to have um, be nice to have some more reliable funding for some of the things we do. But um, one of the big benefits of not having a payment system is we don't have to we do we don't have to ask people for um, any kind of money at the beginning. Um, we say we do ask for a we we ask for a donation or we always accept donations. We appreciate them, uh, and we're able to just kind of roll through that in the conversation. Uh, we have a cash box that's available there. Um, we have an i 
iPad that people can kind of scan, but it's a little bit shoddy. Um, so we try not to take credit card payments in the library. Um, and even with late fines and things like that, we'll say, you know, bring in cash next time or you can go online and you can pay off your late fines. Uh, and we find that that almost always happens. Um, there's also, um, I think I talked a little bit about this and we talked about volunteers keeping like confrontation situations out of the library as much as possible. Um, and that kind of goes back again into the way we manage fines, especially um, if someone really is resistant to offer help or it, it seems like um, they don't have the means or they're just unwilling to pay it. Um, that's something we can resolve down the road um, as a board or, or as a employee, uh, not something that we need to put on our volunteers. We have had a lot of support from the city and different partners, organizations throughout the area um, who are excited about what we do. And I, I don't know if I can definitively say that they would be less supportive if we uh, were charging more, but people really do seem to love that we're not charging uh, for anything. So, um, and I think specifically rent assistance, um, when you have partners like uh, most of our libraries have, um, where you're renting space or borrowing space from a church or a different organization, when that organization changes hands, um, and they may be specifically churches are kind of in a situation in Portland right now. A lot of them are seeing reductions in membership, reductions in participation. And so they're a little bit more squeezed um, to, to pay for their services. And so if you are a system where you're benefiting from what they have available um, and uh, they see an opportunity there with a, with a new minister or a new uh, church president or something like that, or any kind of organizational structure, um, I think that that opens up a little bit more. Um, in East Portland specifically, they had a spot that they were planning to put a storage unit on um, for a few months. And then, you know, they had a changeover in the administration in that church building. And uh, they were told that, you know, they couldn't afford that parking space to park a storage container. So it's definitely a thing that can happen, um, whether or not, you know, you're charging for anything. But um, it has worked out pretty well for us for the most part. Uh, and then you can go on to the next slide, Tom. Definitely uh, some very clear challenges. Most of these are probably things you can uh, predict. Um, the North, Port all of the libraries in Portland with the exception of Green Lens, uh, really don't offer any kind of other programming. They will pop up and do fix it fairs occasionally. Really that's kind of working with partners and participating in things that are operated by the partners. But without that reliable funding, it's hard to develop the infrastructure to do programming. Um, we're fortunate to have a software system that's managed by an individual here. Um, and so that's that's been really helpful. Costs are super, super low for that. Um, but with the amount of money that we have that comes in from donations and uh, late fines, um, it would, it would be very manageable to cover it. I think it, the average for most of our libraries would bring in a little over $1,500 a month. Um, so just general operating costs are very attainable from just donations uh, without kind of asking people for things. Um, we also aren't able to do reservations. Um, sorry. Um, well, we kind of choose not to do reservations in some libraries because um, there's different schools of thought on it in terms of equity. I think we've talked about that in a couple of different places within this collab, but um, giving you know more convenient access to people can certainly build on that equity, um, but also being able to kind of stop in and get things first come first serve uh, is maybe fair, whatever that happens to be, but we, um, it just takes a, a quite a bit more infrastructure and employees and reliable communication systems to do reservations and we aren't able to do that. Um, the, the biggest problem with not having reliable funding um, through a membership program or any other you know, funding stream is just you know, loss of 
institutional knowledge. If, if you aren't, if you lose an employee because you didn't get a certain grant or a, a member, a sponsor backs out, um, there is a very real impact to, to what's going to move forward when you lose that institutional knowledge. Um, and so it re you're relying a lot on at will individuals um, like volunteers and board members and things. Um, with GreenLens, we have uh, a couple different programs that we run, including a pollinator habitat program and a community orchard. Uh, and we've been able to grow the program a bit more. That's been dependent almost entirely on grant seeking. Uh, and there is a very real risk with that sort of a funding model that you can kind of have mission creep where you have to expand your services or, or your areas of focus a little bit um, to be able to meet the terms of the grant. Um, and maybe you need to grow some extra employees that you can now afford at this time for them to do the work for six or eight months. And then you don't want to lose employees because we never want to be laying off people. It's not a good way to do business. Uh, so it can be a tricky situation if you're really heavily dependent on a grant system for funding. Um, yeah, just, I, I think this slide is quickly to say, um, there are partners, Portland is a pretty progressive, pretty green city. So we've got a lot of opportunities to partner with organizations that we support, um, hardware stores that sell consumables that we can work with. Um, we've got a bunch of different and re seemingly redundant programs like environmental sustainability, planning sustainability, all these things in the city of Portland. Um, but they are always, you know, getting different sources of revenue and, and tax revenue and different federal funding. Um, and they will actively seek us out and say, hey, we know you're doing this. Um, we would love to keep, you know, support what you're doing. It's a great feather in their cap as a city. Um, so they will kind of seek us out and they know that we need some amount of funding. Um, and then late fines. So um, first and foremost, having clear policy. And I think that's something uh, that Steve talked about. I talked a little bit about that with having those policies in place. Um, when you're doing your inventory management, but really giving clear guidance so that um, when the volunteer is working, they can you know, cite something to show people why policies are being changed. Um, they vary a bit for um, different tools at different libraries. At Lentz, we do all for a dollar, but there's uh, Northeast will charge $5 in late fines for a lawnmower, for example. Um, so having kind of a sliding scale in some of those things, specifically, I think things that, uh, like Tim had said, things that are going to require more um, infrastructure, more space to fill um, so that you have enough inventory for people. That's really where like you want to incentivize quick returns. Um, yeah. And I think... Um, I can just kind of talk to this for a minute. Um, sorry, I threw some late slide content in, so I'll just go ahead and, and talk to it. Uh, we do do an annual checkup for members. Um, the system automatically prompts people to do an annual checkup. It's required to be filled out and updated. Um, and mostly that's because we have this system that involves boundary lines. We want to make sure people are using the library that's closest to them. That helps with tool recovery and maintaining uh, a supply of tools that's uh, sustainable for our community size. Um, we do revoke privileges, um, but it's pretty rare. If, if your tools come back late, uh, it'll automatically kind of shut those things down and you need to have administrative access to go in and restore those privileges. But generally, uh, if you're in communication with us, we let you do renewals. Um, Lens, we let you do as many renewals as you want, but we do say after the second or third time, really, we, we suggest you bring the tool back um, and then let other members borrow it and come back and get it when, you, uh, when you're ready to actually do your project. Um, but the specifically Northeast Portland, they've got a really unique system in my mind where you have to have the tool, you have to bring the tool in physically so they know you still have it in order to get a renewal and you have to do it in the first hour that they're open. So it's a very, very strict system. And I don't know exactly what the, what the impetus is for that, but it seems to work really well. They got 2000 active happy members. So um, 
what seems crazy to some people, you know, clearly works for others. Um, the biggest thing in terms of revoking privileges for us it, is if you bring back a tool and it's busted and you're not remorseful or not willing to even have a conversation about what happened or what you might have done wrong or how you're going to, you know, pay, uh, if you're able to pay for it. Again, we try not to bring the financial into it. If, if they don't offer to pay for it, we're not going to ask you to. Um, but if you clearly broke it and you're not remorseful about it, um, thanks. This service probably isn't for you. Have a nice day. Uh, yeah. Uh, so then just briefly about, about this slide, um, we've never had to actually um, stop providing services to uh, members because of lack of funds. Now, again, as I had said earlier, there are impacts to losing employees and having to change structure based on um, that lack of you know, reliable, consistent um, usage-based funding like a membership system. Um, but we're, we've been able to keep costs very low. I think it is possible. I'm not saying it's the best system uh, or that it's the system everyone should try for, but if that's you know, organizationally what your goals are, it is possible. Um, but it can be really hard, I'm sure, in a, in a city like Toronto to find the space to do it uh, in a lot of places. Portland gets trickier every day. So um, specifically in COVID, because our costs were so low and our operational costs are almost negligible, um, we most of the libraries didn't operate for up to six months. Uh, Lentz, we really had a very strong um, set of volunteers that were committed to coming in and masking and uh, doing, you know, we would go in the library, get things, bring them out to people. Uh, and we even had a, a email communication system where people could let us know what they were going to have. So we were able to pivot and do that. Um, but being able to adapt to those needs uh, without worrying about, you know, not being able to pay our rent um, was tricky. Um, so I think as low overhead as you can manage, uh, that's good. But yeah, it's, it really depends on kind of what your what your cost environment is. Uh, and then real quick, uh, this is a lot of what kind of Keenan had said, 24-hour um, access uh, for volunteers, really trying to build up that volunteer base because we can't do anything without our volunteers. Um, we have partnered with some maker spaces and things like that, um, service providers, and some small businesses like coffee shops and things in the area to kind of get discount codes for, for business, uh, for volunteers specifically. Um, and then lifetime membership. I actually live 40 minutes outside of um, the Green Lens service area. And I'm we expanded our area, but I'm still about two blocks outside of it. Uh, but I'm still a member because I'm a volunteer. <laughs> so um, if you've put the time in to establish the, the library, um, we're happy to have you come in and borrow tools. So, uh, and I'll just talk really briefly about this. The Rockwood Common Project, we um, are able to kind of work with um, the city of Gresham, which is just outside of Portland to open up uh, this cabinet making shop. Um, and the plan there is uh, to really subsidize, to, to, to leverage those resources and make them still shared uh, resources for the community, um, but to leverage business partnerships and other partnerships in order to pay for those things. So we can still provide the tool library as a free service to the community, um, but being able to work with following a couple of different makerspace models that are in Portland uh, or not in Portland, but in other parts of Oregon, uh, working with community colleges, um, pre-apprenticeship programs, things like that, um, so that we can make it uh, funded and sustainable. Uh, and then really thinking about the millworks and the wood shop and, and stuff like that as a tool that can be borrowed by the community. And if you have the means and it's supporting your business, um, factor that into your business costs. But if you're not, and if you're an individual and you're going to be using it at smaller scale, um, you know, we want to make that as affordable and accessible as possible. All right. Thank you for that. Um, definitely 
interesting to see how just at the beginning, thank you for showcasing all of the different kind of uh, regions uh, where those libraries are situated. Um, can you just talk about how strict the membership to those locations is? I saw some places where there was overlap in coverage, um, but how, how strict has each library been about you know community lines? And is do you feel like the amount of offerings is equitable between those different that the different libraries are offering um it, we are not very strict i personally am not very strict um different libraries have different opinions on that so i can't speak collectively to all of them um it's I, and i think it really ends up being kind of an individual thing if there isn't a written policy our written policy is these are the this is the zone you need to be in the service area um Again, part of that is because of um, what already exists. We don't want um, to be overly redundancy is kind of the biggest concern mm -hmm. that I've seen that holds the most weight um, in conversation. If it's a redundant service, it can be harder to get funding specifically from some of those partner organizations we had talked about. Um, but uh, if, if uh, tool recovery is kind of the other thing, if you're really far away, if you're a 35, 40 minute drive, outside of the city, I don't expect you're going to make it a priority to get this tool back promptly. And we really don't have the means to recover those tools. Um, so if you want to borrow a hammer, yeah, maybe we can talk about that. But if you're looking to, you know, borrow a table saw or a lawnmower or, you know, 15 tools to do this project that you're working on out 45 minutes away, that's probably not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And can you speak about kind of um, you, you talked about the various different ways of of gathering additional income, you know, that are not membership dues. Um, can you talk about specifically, let's say, for Green Lens, where your core funding is coming from? Yeah, so um, we have um, first, first of all, like for the tool library for Green Lens, our cost is extremely low. We have a one dollar lease. And we just need to keep the utilities on. Um, and so that's the library um, fines and donations cover the cost of the library. Um, I just want to preface it with that because any financial issues that Greenlands has had um, to my mind is because we have many other programs that are much more complicated in terms of writing grants, reporting on grants, and filling all that out. So the majority of our funding by far comes uh, from grants. We do a pollinator habitat program that involves a lot of coordinating with service providers, uh, plant providers, private homeowners. Um, we have grown into do, we did some air quality work at one point, some GIS mapping, um, some uh, pedestrian pathway work, a lot of different things that are really great for the community and we're really happy to provide those things. Um, but those are the kind of things where as your organization grows, if the funding environment changes, have to be ready to let people go and adapt and shrink back down. Um, and that can be kind of difficult, especially with, you know, employees that have been with you for four or five years. Um, we do also have a few partnerships specifically with like workshops and those pollinator habitats. We work with um, nurseries and a couple different city de uh, departments and they work with us pretty well to help us find the funding we need to keep those programs running. Uh, recently, uh, the city of Portland reached out to us and said, hey, we want to support your program for three years. Uh, so give us a budget projection. We're going to put it into a federal grant that we're applying for for watershed. Um, mm -hmm. And so we submitted that. We won't know until the middle of the summer if we got that. So we're kind of mm -hmm. operating on, on hope and a prayer right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would be obviously huge. And just on the, just one more question around the like number, like what, can you speak to the different size of the populations that are covered by each one of the Portland uh, tool libraries? Yeah. Um, so Northeast Portland has a lot of industrial areas uh, and there's an airport up there. There's a funny little pocket on our map where there's just a gray area. That's because that's the airport. Um, no, nobody needs to have tool lending <laughs> in the rural area. Um, 
but it's mostly residential, like I had said, on the, the north and the east side. Um, east Portland is extremely residential, more high density housing, um, and it tends to be lower socioeconomic. So um, that's part of why Greenland's expanded is an, almost doubled our service area in 2019 um, so that we could service more of that community. I'm really glad to have East Portland Tool Library coming online so that they can kind of contribute to more of that area. Um, but yeah, I would say it's, Southeast Portland is a lot of rental uh, properties. Um, and so it's interesting to see how many active consistent active members they have and what a large base they have and mm -hmm. what a relatively low drop-off rate they have uh, for active members compared to how many have enrolled. So. Great. All right. Thank you for that. I think, um, I mean, I guess, you know, the final, final thing I just wanted to ask was, you know, which Keenan covered as well is, you know, especially since you don't have, of any type of a uh, financial lever over your members um, and users, has there been any issues with having it be a free service? And uh, if so, how have you worked through any of those those problems with with members as they've come up? Um, I guess I don't. Can you? I don't really understand the question. Yeah, like. Um, has there been, I guess I'm try, trying to, let me see how I reframe it. Um, you know, in any service situations, right, where you're, you're running a business and there's, there's members or customers or users, like there can be issues that, that come up, you know, between those that maybe there's an expectation, there's expectations of the service and there's expectations of the, the patrons, right? And those expectations are not always met and it can lead to frictions either, um, that, that blow up and are very acute or that can fester over time and wondering if there have been situations that you've had to work through to address those with members uh, and did they come through positively? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, so we, we do have the late find system and I think that's probably mm -hmm. the biggest, the predominant lever that we have. Um, if, I mean, I, in my mind, I don't see how like a membership cost would kind of function in, in a lever in that way. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we do have a late find system. Um, we try not to be again, punitive about that. We try to encourage people mm -hmm. to understand it's about being a good steward, about being a good neighbor. Mm -hmm. If you're following the rules, then you're never gonna have to pay anything. But if you're gonna bend the rules, if it's more convenient for you to bring your tool back too late and not answer an email, then it's gonna cost you a little bit. Um, if you want to think of that as a donation, that's fine. I, I'm happy with that. Um, yeah. Happy to have your money. It, it helps us keep the lights on. Um, but yeah, I would say we don't have, um, haven't had a lot of issues with it for the most part. Yeah. I mean, that's helpful to, to hear. I mean, I, my understanding is that's generally the case across uh, the space, but with any of these types of sharing projects, uh, especially when there's not the same type of a fee structure involved, there can be a lot of fear uh, from folks that are starting these projects, that these types of things are something that they're going to have to deal with. And while everyone should be prepared for situations that come up and be, you know, know that they could happen, it's always nice to hear that for the most part, most people show up and are good uh, stewards uh, on both sides of these projects. And that's not something that needs to be feared quite so much. Right. Yeah. I will say that we have, we have had at least one volunteer that I'm aware of that was a little more pushy and punitive in terms of fines and things. Uh, and we did have to kind of ask them not to, not to volunteer anymore. We didn't say you can't be a member. Um, but you know, if you're not representative of, of the voice that we're trying to communicate to our community and our members, um, then it's just, is not the spot for you. So, yeah. And then just a final question here from, from Claire, um, wondering if you feel like you may need to change the membership or financial structure at some point in time in the future. And, or is that something that's been talked about, um, kind of on the board level? 
Yeah, we have been talking about that quite extensively at Greenlands. Um, we recently had a, a executive director who had to leave because it just wasn't sustainable um, because with that employee position, they were also in charge of chasing grants and adapting the organization to fund themselves. And that's just a lot of stress. Um, so we're, we're talking about um, having a membership system kind of, but really still thinking about it as these are donation tiers. Um, and that's something that we've you know gotten from, from y'all. There's a lot of different organizations that phrase it very well and have very good systems that I think uh, we probably will be mimicking. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I really like the model of, you know, charging, having a business rate um, for small businesses. We do have a few landscapers and uh, small contractors that'll come in and, and borrow a few tools. And you can tell from the way they come back and the amount of dust on them and stuff like that and how frequently they're borrowing that like either you've got one heck of a house or you're doing a lot of work for a lot of people. So um, those people, I will kind of say, hey, you know, and they'll also often say to us, yeah, I left a job at a tool site, so I'm just going to have to pay you a, or at a work site, so I'm going to have to pay you an extra late fine. And I remind them that, like, you know, if there's extra work that's going, that's you're putting into these tools, that's extra cost for us to have to replace it. So please consider, you know, donating some of that income to help, you know, this operation keep going for both of our sakes. Because if, if the library can't stay open, your business, it sounds like, might not either. So, no. All right. Well, thank you for that, uh, Jason. And thank you, everyone, um, for joining us and sticking around uh, until this point. Uh, clearly, this is a very rich conversation, and there's a lot of factors that need to be considered when one sets up their their membership structure um and what their how they set their relationships with members and it's been really helpful to hear kind of three different ways of of doing that so um really appreciate that and also uh thank you everyone for weighing in on the chat so much it was a very vibrant chat space for today and uh a thick question you know lots of good content in there that uh, has not come through in the conversation, although much of it has worked its way in in one way or another. Um, but as a reminder, we do save these chats as well, and we put them up on Canvas. And so you can access that content afterwards if there was something that you saw, a link that was shared, um, a good idea that you might want to incorporate. You can find all of that content as well to not only for yourself, or but to also share it with others that you may be working and organizing with. Um, we also just want to point out that there is that feedback form that's been put in the chat. Thank you, Paige, for dropping it one last time. These do really help us uh, determine how we shape the content within this collab. And we also draw from it. And we're after the the 12 sessions are over at the end of May, we're planning on having um, additional monthly sessions for the rest of the year to address questions, deeper things that you know that come up in in these sessions that we yeah, we want to to go, you know, look at more fully that couldn't be fully addressed in that this time. So given that feedback, that's going to factor into what that continuing education is going to look like. Uh, and also just lets us share that with our presenters and shape the next sessions that are coming up within these 12. Uh, so with that, going to thank you all for sticking around. We do actually need to close the space, so we're not going to have time today to to chat. Uh, but we'll be back here next week, same time, same place. And we'll be talking about fundraising, I believe. So uh, we're going to get into all the nitty gritty of, of that and hear some nice case studies uh, and ways of, of funding and being able to maintain these, these new libraries and current ones as well. So uh, looking forward to seeing you all then and have a good rest of your days or evenings, wherever you may be. Bye, everyone.